I'd like to present to you Dr. T. Colin Campbell, who's going to be our next speaker at 1 o'clock. Dr. Colin Campbell is the author of the China Study, and he's a respected nutrition researcher at Cornell University. He's also the focus of the film Forks Over Knives. His comprehensive study on the relationship of diet to health has successfully introduced people to the health benefits of a plant-based diet, and his work has brought veganism into mainstream discussions. Dr. Campbell will be doing a book signing following this presentation today. So uh, if we run over, please follow him to the Veg Worcester table where he'll be doing the signing. Um, his, after his talk at the, uh, after this talk, he'll be on the, at the main entrance where just about everybody probably came in. The Veg Worcester table is right there. Buy the book and the DVD. He's going to sign them for you. and. We'll have a special discounted price today. Help me welcome Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I'd also particularly like to thank Caitlin as well for uh, organizing this effort. She's the first one who contacted me and has a, had a lot to do with putting on this organization, and for that I'm very grateful. Um, gosh, this is a this is a good group. I see you from here. My, uh, I don't have a lot of time, obviously, and I'm going to try to squeeze in something like 55 years worth of work into the next 55 minutes. Uh, it's not easy to do, uh, but uh, my background, as uh, many of you know, is in science. I got, came to this idea primarily from the laboratory, being a researcher. Much of it at Cornell, in fact, most of it at Cornell University. And uh, what I now know, as probably many of you already know about me, is that the views I now have is, is was probably, it's, it's almost the antithesis, the, the, the opposite of what I started with in the beginning of my career. And I never would have guessed 50 some years ago when I got went to graduate school that uh, I would be standing here talking about this topic at this time, but I must say that this information for me has become really uh, very profound. I, I think that it's, it's, it obviously is about what we eat, it's about other things we do, and uh, so I, I think it's so profound that now in the present day, as far as I'm concerned, it really has something to do with, in fact, this topic that I sort of want to talk about today, and that is the healthcare system. Uh, we all know that the healthcare system is in trouble, and uh, in fact, uh, quite serious trouble. I'm not sure how many people really know how, how serious this really is. It's a very high cost system. The United States, as a matter of fact, has the highest per capita medical care cost of any country in the world, twice as high, at least, of the next highest country. Number one. Number two, uh, the cost of health care, as a matter of fact, um, is, uh, I mean, the quality of health care in this country is not as good as what you might think. Uh, when the United States is put on the, onto a chart compared to other countries, more or less of, our, of the industrialized Western countries, uh, we rank near the bottom, believe it or not. So here we are paying an enormous amount of money uh, and uh, running it and getting into a lot of trouble. It's continuing to go up. At the same time, we don't have the quality of of the health that we are entitled to. So it's really a bad business model. So what, that, I mean, and that's where I am, I guess, at the present time. And I think about this context, this, this question concerning what we eat as, as sort of a centerpiece in a way of resolving, helping to resolve that problem. And for me, uh, to try to think about the kind of things that we, I think, ought to be thinking about, uh, we've got to get it on a good scientific basis. We've got to get a really good, a good sound scientific basis because I spent about 20 years actually very active in national policy development on expert panels, giving testimonials before Congress and things like our congressional committees. And uh, I, I know the policy community. I know the so-called establishment, if you will, the establishment community. I was part of it. Uh, and uh, I, I know that in order to get transformation, of an idea like this into the mainstream America, not just into some like special interest groups, but the mainstream America. The only way that's going to happen is we get the science right. It's really, really important. And so I think the more that I can help to bring professionalism to this committee, 
the happy we're going to be. Now, so in any case, coming back to this, the, the topic for today is obviously it's it's really narrowed down into a rather narrow slice of things. But what I want to just tell you is some of the re reveal for you, you know, some of the questions that got me thinking about this many years ago. When I got into research and first started getting an inkling of some of this kind of thing, uh, insofar as research is concerned, it was not just testing, you know, what effect did this food have on something else or what effect did this nutrient have on something else. It, that was not the purpose. It was really to actually design this information in a way in which I could actually inquire more deeply about what the relationship is between food and health. And eventually to establish, especially if I look back, establish what I call principles of nutrition. Because if we get the principles of nutrition right, then I think that we can begin to advance, you know, from a fairly good scientific basis. And so I'm going to take you through just a few observations of my early career that actually, as I look back, uh, really had a fairly profound effect on my thinking because they really began to challenge dogma. They challenged the conventional way of thinking about nutrition, the way I was taught nutrition, the way I in turn taught my students nutrition early on. It really started to challenge this kind of thing. And so I'm going to select for my comments here today the work that I actually did, which gets me into, with some people, I don't want this to be misunderstood. Uh, so I want to just put it up front right in the, in the beginning, especially at a conference like this. We used experimental animals at that time. And I know that for many, of course, for good reason, um, that's, that's obviously how to question. And I fully understand that, I fully support that kind, that kind of notion. But at the same time, I was in research, that's the way we did things, and I did it in a way in which we could learn principles. And I can tell you that the misunderstanding about the way science is done sometimes is not quite right. And so I want to use the work that we did involving experimental animals at the beginning to tell you the principles because those principles got me to really challenge my own views and challenge the system within which I was a part and eventually to get me to where I am now, which is a much more, a much broader, holistic and more compassionate way of thinking about things. So in any case, let's come back and then ask this question about the healthcare system. As I say, it's, a, it's a not a good state. So what's missing? I mean, the healthcare debate, as you, many of you know, and, and the Healthcare Reform Act, as a matter of fact, that's now before the US Supreme Court, uh, as we sit here, uh, that, that discussion, that debate, or that shouting match, I should say, that shouting match has been going on, the people who were involved in that discussion are talking about possible solutions to reduce healthcare costs. None of them are talking, what they're talking about, who's going to pay the future bills? They're not talking about, you know, how do you make people well in order to reduce costs? I mean, that, that's a pretty fundamental uh, uh, distinction between what's going on now, even before the Supreme Court and Congress and elsewhere. Uh, they're talking about who's going to pay the future bill. There's a lot of money to be made in the present system, as you know. And that's one of the reasons everybody fights over, because they want a little piece of that pie, and nobody wants to give up the share in fact they have. But so we're not... At the senior level, we're not talking about you know, how to make people well in order to re reduce health care costs. So there's something missing. There's something missing in this whole argument. Is that. It's nutrition. Just pure and simple. It's nutrition. We don't understand it. So what is nutrition? <clears throat> I, after my some have more than half century working in this field, as I say in policy research and teaching, um, I sort of look at it, if I look back, there's a couple of ideas that I find that, a couple of messages, let's say, that have emerged for me, a couple of messages that are, in my view, inseparable, inseparable. So I have to consider the two together. One is thinking, of how does nutrition work? What is that meaning, nutrition? If you look across the land, I think you would agree that everybody's really terribly confused about what it is. Everybody has their own ideas. Well, which kind of food, which kind of nutrition you get, and so forth and so on. A lot of this, of course, very personal. Uh, so we don't understand nutrition. And second is, if we do understand nutrition from the scientific perspective, the next question there is maybe even the preliminary question, or the companion question is, well, what foods do we eat to get that kind of nutrition? And most of you here who are assembled are eating the right food, I can assure you, <laughs> to start with. Um, here, but before I get into telling you a little bit about the principles, what I want to do here is to say what nutrition is not. And th this is an important point because here I'm talking about, a, a, depending on how you count it, it's at least a $30 billion industry today. 
some of that's demanded to be counted, you know, in a broader, broader sense, it's about a $60 billion industry. It's a diversion. It's a diversion, has been a diversion for the last 30 years. <coughs> Namely, nutrition is not about taking nutrient supplements. That's not what it is. I was involved, in fact, in the very beginning, when the industry was first starting back in the 80s, and was asked when there were court case, cases, and it was a discussion before the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, uh, and there were debates going on about the industry getting together to put, you know, these nutrients into pills, get the industry kicked off. There was a lot of money to be made, obviously, at that point in time. And I was asked to be the chief witness in the Federal Trade Commission hearings in Washington for over a period of three years as that debate was going forward. And I took some views at that time, and I didn't think the nutrient, nutrient supplements were going to work at that time. Uh, I just kind of stayed out of the field to some extent over the years from then on, but I certainly paid a lot of attention to what, in fact, she eventuated. And what is eventuated is this. Nutrients, nutrients out of context don't work, despite of what you may think. Uh, they may look like they work in the short term. Sure enough, you can look at things that, I mean, uh, good, honest people would look at that and say, oh, that's I'm feeling better, this is, the, so forth and so on. But now we have the, the advantages of something like, what is it, 25, 30, 35 years almost. I'm looking back and, and doing a lot of scientific testing on nutrient supplements to see, do they work? No, they don't really. Here's just the evidence right here, beta-carotene or lung cancer, that's a classic case. Beta-carotene, as you may know, is a, is a pre-vitamin A. It creates the, the yellow color in vegetables, it's part of all green vegetables. It's great, it's great stuff, it's an antioxidant, we all knew that. And it turns out that it's rich in vegetables. In fact, it's only produced in plants. It's produced in the colored parts of plants. And so what, what was noticed many years ago, the higher the vegetable intake, the lower the risk for some cancers. If you did those kind of studies, and they say, oh, this is, this is great stuff, it must be beta-carotene. And so there were studies published in the early 1980s, late 1970s, in fact showing that the higher the beta-carotene consumption from vegetables, the lower the risk for cancer. And so the next obvious question they thought, at least they thought it was obvious, well, let's take that beta-carotene out, let's put it into a pill. Let's give it to people. And at that time, beta-carotene was the key uh, nutrient supplement, so that was done. And it was an eight-year study. The first report of this phenomenon was an eight-year study that was done in Finland, joint study between the United States and Finland, where they took a bunch of smokers, heavy smokers, destined to get a certain rate of lung cancer, treated with um, lots of vegetables, if you will, or at least they didn't, they didn't do it as an intervention study. They kind of looked back to see what they were doing. And then they, they, they also looked at the question concerning whether the beta-carotene and their supplements would work. After eight years, what they found out was that the beta-carotene supplements did not decrease lung cancer, as was hypothesized. In fact, it increased lung cancer, statistically significantly so. That really disturbed the industry at the time. And uh, so since then, we've seen now lots of studies. There's been virtually, I'm sure, hundreds of studies of this kind where vitamin E, great kind of vitamin, we should take it to reduce heart disease, and prostate cancer and so forth and so on. You can just see a few items here. The latest on this list of casualties is omega-3. When you take this out as a supplement, you try to take it that way, it does not do what we think it does. The reason I want to make a point about this, this is not nutrition, this is pharmacology. This is the form of therapy, uh, pharmacotherapy, if you will, pharmacology. It's drug treatment. It's just giving the drug in a little bit earlier st stage of the, of the disease process. And so I went, let's, let's move on past that. So I set that aside. Nutrition, in contrast, involving nutrients, they work really spectacularly well when nutritionists are consumed as food. In that study, by the way, as cancer went up, when supplements went up, cancer went up, those who were consuming more, more beta-carotene from the food, cancer went down. So beta-carotene in the food works. Beta-carotene in supplements, it doesn't. So here's a, this, it's, I'll come back to this point a little bit later on. So here's a, some, some um, very specific sort of citations and results of some of these summary kind of uh, reports that have been published. This one in 2008, they said no evidence to support the antioxidant supplements to prevent mortality in healthy people with various diseases. Beta carotene, vitamin A, and vitamin A significant increased mortality. I, I don't want to ask the question now because you probably won't raise your hand. How many of you have taken supplements? You're probably ready to drive me off the stage here. <laughs> but you do have to take a look second look. It's not a crutch. 
people are saying, oh, you know, I need to take leisure because the food is not the same as it used to be and so forth and so on. And, and you know, as they do that, they don't make the major changes they need to make. And the major changes they need to make is basically eating whole plant-based foods. Stay away from the processed foods or stay away from the animal-based foods. That's really the bottom line. That's where the big bang for the buck is. Omega-3 fats. Uh, I'm going to just kind of skip through this quickly because I don't have a lot of time. I mean, we're, this 59 was a mistake. There's 89 studies now. 89 studies, a huge amount, millions and millions of dollars studying this question. Do omega-3 fats work? And the comment is that long chain and shorter chain omega-3 fats do not have a clear effect on total mortality, combined cardiovascular disease events, or cancer. And then they even suggested that, although it's not significant, it may actually increase the risk of cancer. Omega-3 fats increasing the risk of cancer. Omega-3 fats in the form of supplements. Here's another really quick, uh, big, big, big study. Almost 10,000 cases of diabetics, 3 million person a year. I mean, this is not a little plaything. This is a huge, huge, big study. And what they found here is that people, as they increase their consumption of omega-3 supplements, the risk of diabetes goes up, and it's highly, highly significant. Even omega-3s that come from fish is a bit of a problem, too. Now, I want to get, let's get into the principles real quick here on cancer. Cancer was an area that I worked in early in my career where I really kind of got stuck, I got started in this idea about nutrition playing a role in, in important diseases. But before I do this, let me just point out, this is a sort of model of cancer development that we all tend to uh, work on as far as research is concerned. We started, at, it goes to stages over many years. Cancer starts out very early, let's say many years before, in the initiation stage. That's where there is an event that occurs where the gene or genes that are involved in cancer, those genes are altered in a way in which a normal cell is converted to a cancer cell. So that's the initiation stage, first, totally genetic. And then there's this long stage in between which became the very exciting part of my career. And that had to do with, once you plant cancer seeds that had caused a genetic alteration, that doesn't necessarily lead to cancer. The thing that makes it cancer is what you do with those seeds after they're planted. Same as what you do when you plant seeds in a lung, for example. In other words, cancer will develop even if you have bad genes for cancer, let's say, and it so happens that people do, uh, that those genes are not necessarily, or those early cancer cells are not necessarily going to give rise to cancer. You have to fertilize them. And we fertilize them with the food we consume. And when we consume high protein, high fat kind of diets, you know, low in vegetables and, and so forth and so on, that's what we're doing, we're fertilizing. Now I'm gonna show you real quick here some of the results that uh, got me onto this. Uh, starting actually about, gosh, I think it's this long, but 45, 50 years ago. So this is a summary of going back about 45, 50 years ago up until maybe about 20 or 25 years ago. Here's where I got the principles from that actually is, that is, is, is the framework within, within which I sort of formulate my own ideas about nutrition. Here's a study in experimental rats in this particular case um, where the rats were predisposed to getting cancer. The cancer seeds are there. That's what I call genetic initiation. And so the first three weeks, I mean in the first 12 weeks of the cancer formation, they were fed two different levels of protein of all things. Protein is really valuable protein. I've had about three people tell me today, I gotta do such and such because I've got to get them, I gotta get my protein. You've heard the story. Everybody wants to make sure they get them protein. So I thought that too. I've been as you probably know. So they, they had two groups of animals, five percent protein, five percent of total calories as protein, by the way. Five percent of total calories as protein. Five percent protein and twenty percent, and there you can see the result. This actually came from an observation I did in the Philippines together with a publication in India back in the 1960s. But in any case, the 20% protein, the good levels, the cancer is growing rather well. <laughs> then, um, <laughs> this was part was really kind of shook my boat at the time. Uh, we wanted to see if this 20% protein, the good levels, are turning on cancer, what happens if we switch it back and forth? So we did another study, page 20%, back to five, back to 20. And so this, we, we found that we could turn on and turn off cancer growth. Just like you can turn on and turn off your grass growth in your lawn, let's say. You know, you put some fertilizer on there, you make sure you get the water, it's going to get kind of green, right? You don't, it kind of gets brown. Comes back again, it doesn't die. The same, it's the same uh, natural order of things. So lesson number one, in principle, cancer growth controlled by nutrition. That for me was astounding, it was for my colleagues at the time. 
because everybody assumed cancer came from genes. Cancer does start with genes, but that's not the cause of the cancer at the end of the day. People thought it started with viruses, but that's not the cause of the cancer at the end of the day. It really is, has to do with the way in which these cancers are fertilized and go forward. And so here's a quick summary, a little schematic in this particular case. We have normal cells at the top. And let's say one group of cells on the left, there's more cancer genes there amongst them, let's say more cancer seeds, more prominent, more, more po greater possibility of forming cancer. And on the right, you see less cancer genes, just very simple little schematic. And, and, and if you proceed on from there, with the same diet and so forth and so on, obviously the situation has more cancer starting in the beginning, you're going to go more cancers eventually at the end. So this is essentially, in this case, in this model, cancers are determined by genes, which a lot of people want to think, but not, not quite that way. Here's what, so genes cause cancer. Here's what the, the, uh, the shock, in a sense, for me, and that was that doing this study again, and we did these kind of studies, you can start out with a situation with a lot of, a lot of cancer seeds. If you feed them low protein, for example, less tumors. And the ones that start out with not very many seeds, high protein, more tumors. What this shows is, is basically, nutrition causes cancer. It's not genes, it's nutrition. It's really quite clear. And so we did this with some other nutrients and some other situations besides this too. So lesson number two, nutrition controls genes. This is again a big story. That's what nutrition is. We all have our genes, doing all kinds of different things. We have our gen genome, if we can sort of program and know what our genes are. We're getting to know this and that, you know, about the 25,000 or 23,000, whatever it is, genes we have. We're beginning to understand something about how these genes play a role in, in disease. But actually, at the, at the end of the day, it's nutrition controls which genes are going to be expressed to do what. We have genes to give us good habits. We have genes to make us fit. We have genes to do a lot of good things for us, fortunately. So we got an enormous number of very good genes to do a lot of good things for us. We got a few mischief genes in there. And if you eat the right food, this is what the bottom line is. Eat the right food, have the right kind of nutrition. This body has an amazing wisdom to keep it under control. The bad genes say, hey, just stay there. Don't, don't, don't come up and start growing. Keep them under control and encourage the growth of good genes. It's what I call the wisdom of the body to, to be able to do that. It's really quite remarkable. So uh, the next question was, we get, there's a couple of principles. Here's another principle. This, this, on this one here, uh, it, I was interested in knowing, you know, what, is the, what explains this nutrient effect, in this case protein? How does it actually increase cancer? You know, when you're using it kind of to promote the cancer. Uh, so there we have our model, I explained to you before. And with the presumption that we made at that time, and, to, and this is a fundamental presumption of the entire practice of medicine. It is Western medicine. Western medicine is a situation where we can take maybe a single chemical, we call it the drug, right, operating on a single mechanism, this biochemical reaction or that one or something else. In other words, it works on this in order to affect a certain disease outcome. So in the, in the medical model, I'll come back to this, it's very linear. This causes this causes this, right? Very simple, very straightforward. So we were looking in this case too for, okay, this protein has this amazing effect. Can we explain it? That's the only, about the only way sometimes you convince colleagues of anything. You know, in, in, in the professions, is you explain how it works. So it turned out we looked at all these mechanisms involved in this gene you know, changes and stuff like that having to do with early cancer during the initiation stage, that first stage, and I'm not going to get into all that, those other things, I just wanted to put them there to show you that we did look for what the mechanism, the explanatory mechanism was. A change in enzyme system, change in this or that or something else, every time we looked for one we found a mechanism, couldn't find it, we didn't know which one was really important. And the second stage, same thing, and finally came to the realization that the model we're working with doesn't really work. The model that we assume in medicine and health, that this cause was well, a single chemical, a single nutrient, or single this or single that, you know, causing a specific response. You know, you can see some of the evidence for that kind of thing, but that's not what matters. That's what matters. It turns out that when causes produce effects, they operate through a whole, just a, a symphony of mechanisms. I like to use the word symphony because nutrition all of a sudden becomes a symphony. 
I'll return to in just a moment. So, lesson number three, nutrition acts not by, not by one, but by countless mechanisms as it is symphony. One more lesson here. Um, so far, I just showed you what 5% and 20% does. What about the in-between levels? Well, we did a study here where, for example, we, we had four, six, eight, and 10, as you can see. We didn't get any cancer growth. This is a situation where, again, there was predisposition for getting cancer. So up to about 10% protein, no cancers. No cancer, but above the 10% got cancers. You can see the relationship. That, to me, was, was really striking because then you start asking other kinds of questions. What does that mean? Well, it turns out that 10% protein, when you don't get cancers, it shows that protein is an essential nutrient. We absolutely need it. That's not the question. The question is how much? Well, we need up to, let's say, 10%. And by the way, you can easily get 10% protein, easily, by consuming a whole plant-based, um, whole food plant-based diet. You don't need any extra protein, forget it. If you're eating good quality, high quality, vegetables, fruits, and grains, and legumes, especially putting some legumes in all of them, you get all the protein you really need, doing good stuff. When we start exceeding that, that's when you get into trouble. And you can see there. So then you can ask the question, well, what causes us to exceed that? Because in reality, we all do. The traditional human consumption patterns are such that most people in this country are consuming between about 11 and 22, I think the latest figures are, or something like that. Uh, it's in the range where you might expect to see a cancer response and an increase in cholesterol and an increase in cholesterol is associated with the development of heart disease. And this and this, and 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 and. In other words, you get above 10%, you start getting in trouble. So what's the average protein intake in the American public? It's about 17%. We're up here, this, this is the average about here, and about 95% of the population is somewhere in that range. So we're in the territory where you might anticipate, hey, there's some problems here. <clears throat> so how do we sort that out and get some common, make some common sense out of this? <clears throat> it turns out, incidentally, the amount of protein required in this study here in the case of laboratory animals, it's virtually about the same as we humans need. So in that sense, we're sort of equivalent. Um, it turns out that up to here, see that PL at the top, that means plant. If you, you can increase your protein intake, you don't even need to think about it, it just happens. Up here, this, you get this, this kind of protein. That's what you want. We end up going this way, why? Because most of the people in this country are introducing animal-based foods in their diet. That's what's happening. Seventy percent of our total protein intake right now in the United States, on average, is coming from animal-based foods. For me, this is a very significant, um, I don't know, a finding, I think an observation, that you know, if we want to really raise questions about the people, about uh, consumption of animal-based foods, this is what we're talking about. We're getting up into a territory where the protein is getting too high, and all kinds of other things change with it. This becomes important because the protein we were using, and I'm sure many of you know this, uh, was casein. Casein, the main protein in cow's milk. That's what turns on cancer. When that in excess, that's above 10%. When it leads to excess protein to take above 10%, that's when it operates. It, it doesn't mean the casein all by itself, a little molecule here and there, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to have you know, a necessary deleterious effect, but, it's, uh, but it also turns out the casein would do that, but two plant proteins did not. It would fit the higher levels. We got another lesson here. Nutrients act phenomenally well with whole plant-based foods. It's not just protein. It's fat, it's antioxidants, the dietary couple of, uh, the, uh, complex carbohydrates, and so forth and so on. So there, here's another way of looking at this between plants and animals. What, I'm, what I've shown here are some of the main groups of nutrients of plants and animals. Antioxidants got as a group, complex carbohydrates, protein, fat, and vitamins. I don't know how many of you know this, but plants and animals are different. <laughs> you know, animals, plants don't talk back to us very, very much. Um, but in any case, look at the anti antioxidants. They're only present in plants. At least they're only produced in plants. Not really in animals. The, the, the only extent to which you find antioxidants in animal flesh and animal food and so forth and so on, is the extent to which the animal was consuming that kind of food at the time they were slaughtered. So you'll see some beta character in the world, you see this, see that, sure enough. But that's, that's a small part. I mean, antioxidants, which is a really big ticket item for good health. 
across the board. Cancer, heart disease, and a variety of other things. So we plant we're present plants. Why would we want to eat the animals on that basis? Complex carbohydrates. I know carbs have taken a bad rap in recent years, thanks to Dr. Atkins and many others, unfortunately. But they were talking about refined carbohydrates, sugar and white flour. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about complex carbohydrates. So again, complex carbohydrates are only found in plants. Now, there's a little bit of what we call glycogen in the muscles and the liver, let's say, of animals, but that's, it. that's, that's nothing, that's only one percent of what the level might be, for example, in the case of pl in, uh, in, uh, plants. So they got the advantage here. And here, protein and fat, the average level of fat and protein as a percent of total calories is, as you can see, there are 9, 10, 11 percent or so uh, on the average diet, and that's ideal. That's ideal. Animals have fairly bit more fat and, and protein. Now, there are some exceptions, and by the way, you know coconut, for example, has more fat and, and um, guacamole or what, what do you call that? <laughs> Avocado, you have to think of it. And, and nuts, I mean, they, they get a little higher than that, obviously, but it's a whole plant, it's got lots of antioxidants going with it, so it, it, it looks like an exception, this really isn't. So here's animals up here, vitamins only in plants. Now that may surprise you. You say, wait a minute, I know that vitamin A is in in the milk, and I know vitamin A is in eggs. But vitamin A is not a vitamin, by the way. Huh. Vi vitamin A, as we learned about it way back in the 1920s, was the metabolite of the real vitamin A. The real vitamin A is beta carotene. The retinol is in liver, it's not a vitamin, it's a metabolite. So we got, you know, we went down the long road in that one. Vitamin D is not a vitamin either, because our bodies make it. A vitamin, by definition, is something we need because we can't synthesize it. So vitamins are made in, in animals. You should look at that. It's not a, it's, I mean, I think that's a spectacular differentiation of what animals-based foods and plant-based foods really are, as far as the nutrient content is concerned. And this it begins to explain why we see the effects we do when we consume whole plant-based foods. It, I mean, this you can write books on this and just look into the depths of this, and I don't think that that idea really will ever be challenged. To give some idea of what a whole food plant-based diet is, given those kind of nutrients. And I should say, we got this bunch of principles now we're accumulating here. We can live by. Principles extrapolate from one species to another. From one condition to another. That's why principles are principles. It's really something fundamental. So anyhow, plant-based foods, whole plant-based foods. Here's right here, here's the literature in the scientific literature coming from peer-reviewed research findings. I got involved in this um, formally, at least in a, more, in a little more concerted way when I was writing the book with my son, Tom. And uh, we went back and started looking at the literature to see if any of the evidence was already there. And, and much to, not, not too much to my surprise, I guess, but certainly I didn't know it was this extensive. All these diseases here, some of them pretty serious, as you can see. Some of them may be more of the nuisance category. But in any case, those diseases, those illnesses, can all actually be prevented. And if they're in progress, like cancer and certain autoimmune disease, like multiple sclerosis and things like that, they can be prevented. They can actually be suspended. That is, stop them where they are. They don't progress forward. And, very excitingly, a lot of these diseases, really serious ones, can be reversed and cured. And therein lies, I think, the greatest opportunity for the future. The recognition this kind of diet is not just for preventing future problems that you may not care about or you're going to postpone your thinking on. It's the idea of using this kind of diet to treat existing disease. Just think about that. So switching can really have major effects. So I like the word holism. Because what I'm talking about here is a whole lot of things working together through multiple mechanisms, variety of response, wisdom of the body, all those kind of concepts. And I spell it with a W on it. You don't find that in the dictionary. Um, and I've done a little bit of history considerations on this. We talk about holism, we always spell the word H-O-L-A, and I think that's been, unfortunately, a bit of a conundrum. Because if we call it holism with H on it, it suggests to the scientists something a little different than what is science. That's, that's one of the problems. So wait a minute, I, I want to use the word holism the way I think it was intended at the beginning, I'm really convinced it was. Put the W there, where it belonged. And so I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, Webster's Dictionary and Oxford Dictionary get busy and put that word back in the dictionary again, but 
we'll see how that works out. Um, so here is, here is a, a different way of thinking about science. Not this really narrow little stuff, one thing at a time, one finger. So we did the China study, as many of you know about. Um, this is a big human study that we did. It was the first study between the United States and China at the time. And, and Bob, we directed it uh, from Cornell, but uh, it included Oxford University and some Chinese academies. And we took advantage of the fact that the Chinese had observed in early 1980s, as a result of a survey they did in the 1970s, that for different kinds of cancers, they tended to concentrate in certain areas of the country and not in others. So we said, okay, let's go ahead and do a study. Let's, let's see why does cancer occur here, not there. That was sort of a very simplistic sort of notion about it. Turns out cancer is geographically localized. Something we sort of knew, but in the China situation, it was really, really uh, emphasized in quite, quite a spectacular way. So cancer is localized geographically. We did a nationwide survey of 130 villages, collected a vast amount of data on nutrition and hormones and enzymes and, and different diseases and so forth and so on. Uh, all having to do with diet, lifestyle, disease, mortality. We did a study, uh, ended up with a massive amount of information and said, okay, what do we do with this? We started analyzing it bit by bit in a very narrowly way, but we did, did it in order to see how it related to the whole, not standing alone. So this was our conclusion. The vast majority of the hypothetical cause and effect associations favor in less disease reflect the nutrient composition of plant-based food. Now, I hope that that statement means something to you when you realize that the difference between plants and animals comes back to nutrients composition. Um, and so in a, in a sort of more practical lay terms, let's say plant-based whole foods, less total protein or fat, no animal protein, associated with less chronic degenerative diseases, and it is consistent with other kinds of studies, the experimental uh, animal studies that we did, as a matter of fact. Uh, in China, we also saw it in, in spades, too, because of all the diseases we measured in China, we asked the question, was, any, was there any tendency for diseases to cluster together geographically? And I can't tell you the way we did that in analysis, but it turns out that we got two groups of diseases that tended to cluster. Here's all the Western kind of diseases, the cancer, heart disease, diabetes over here. And over there, we got other kinds of things that more have to do with infections and so forth. So you got poverty diseases, we call them apple diseases, Western diseases, whatever. This was kind of interesting, because all these diseases here are associated with diseases in the same list. Same as all these diseases associated with diseases in this list too. So here we got this. So then we can ask the question, if all these diseases are tended to clump together geographically, there must be something in the, let's say, the environment or the way they live or something sociological or whatever. We had an opportunity to see what were the chief correlates of this, and it turned out to be increased cholesterol from very low levels, going from 90 up to about 170, even below the levels that most of us see. So just increasing cholesterol levels going up like that, that's when heart disease and diabetes and cancer, that's when they all start to emerge. And it turns out that increase in cholesterol that was occurring was coming in response to the consumption of animal-based foods. Even though in China they weren't consuming in rural China that many animal-based foods at the time. But for me, when I saw that, I said, wow, this, here's a human study, the biggest, most comprehensive study ever done in this area, all of a sudden showing results that coincide with and elaborated on and even, even confirmed the same kind of things that we were seeing in the laboratory uh, of other different kinds of studies. So kind of put the capstone for me on the whole idea that we're working with something here. So. Um, I made, I made a, just a quick statement about the treatment of illness using whole plant-based foods. I, this is something that, this is the future. This is something you may not have heard of, a lot about. I think this is the future, as I said. If you, if you know that you can take this kind of food, and you can cure your illnesses that you now have, and you can cure illnesses you may have you didn't know you had. You know, like hypertension, higher blood pressure, this, I mean, uh, higher pressure levels and so forth and so on. It turns out, and, we, and I've been associated with some folks doing that, including my own son, uh, doing, just taking a group of people. You can take just a group of everyday people. He did with some guys who called themselves rednecks down in North Carolina. But I mean, they were, this was the last thing that they really wanted, wanted to do. So you take a group of 25, 30, 40, 50 people or so, and you give them the food they ought to be eating. Make it tasty. Make it tasty. That's what it is. If you do that, you come back, you have a, have a look, what happens? 
the results are dramatic. And there's not, in matters of years, it's not a matter of months, it's a matter of days. Do we say, you know, do it as short a time as five days, 10 days, 15 days, he did it 13 days. You can see weight drop like that. You can see cholesterol coming down. Triglycerides start to uh, correct themselves. Pains and aches that people have, especially older people, like arthritic pains and stuff like that, headaches maybe, they go away. It's amazing. I'm sure that many of you here in here know that that happens. And talking about convincing people, you take people who, you know, have their difficulties, whatever they may be, and most people do it one way or another, and they do this and they watch their numbers change. They watch their feelings change. So the effect, incidentally, is very broad. Here's the power of a whole plant-based diet. It's very broad, unlike drugs. No drug can have this broad effect like that. Very broad, it's quick acting, days to weeks. It's vital, deaths are spared. My friend Dr. Esselton and Dean Ornish before him and somebody before them showed that you take people with advanced heart disease. You put them on this kind of diet and the heart disease goes away and put it in the background. You've seen that, I think, in the Force of a Nice film. And all of this, this is all, this is diet, 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 this is vegetables and fruits and grains. How about this? No known side effects. Compare that with the drug therapy we rely on in this country. There is no comparison. These are universes apart. This is one planet, and doing it the other way, the way a lot of people do it, is the other planet. We don't even need to think that way. We can take this approach here and get far better results quicker in every which way. So, unfortunately, the present nutrition narrative is reductionist, as I say. That's focused on one thing at a time, and this is, I think this is really key. And just to illustrate to you how, how I, what I mean by that, we have the recommended dietary allowances. You've heard them, RDAs. How many have heard of RDAs? Everybody's basically heard of RDAs. Well, if you look at, you know, what that means, here's how much, here's how many milligrams of vitamin C you should consume. Here's how many grams of protein you should consume. Here's how many this, here's how many that. The recommended dietary allowances, which have been around since 1943, formally, organized by committee that visits the question every five years. I know very well. Um, that, that's focused on one nutrient at a time. That's really narrowing our thinking in ways we should, in which we should not be thinking because it takes us eye off the ball about thinking about things working together. Food labeling. Food labeling is helpful, I guess, uh, to some extent. I was on the committee, in fact, that established the latest, the, the most recent guidelines for the way food labels should work, and I was at the position on the committee and whatnot to eliminate food labeling, but I didn't go that far. But at least to minimize the information there. Have enough there to give a person an idea, especially what's in processed foods. Processed foods are not the way of what I'm talking about. Something's high in fat, you look there, it's high in fat, high in salt, you don't want that. I mean, so, there's certainly certain, so food labeling certainly helps. But my point is about this is that the labels are all focused on one nutrient at a time as if they have special, special magic power uh, or maybe properties. And of course, I talked about the bottom of the supplement industry. Um, again, all of the, 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 the origin of those ideas which are prominent in our society, and we all sort of identify with that kind of stuff, that's, that's where nutrition has been treated in a very reductionist way. Misleading, terribly misleading. This is the source of a lot of the, the um, confusion amongst the public. Me medical narrative. Look what we do with the medical narrative. I've already referred to it. In the med practice of medicine, we think about single causes. We hear chemical carcinogens cause cancer. That's it. Or genes cause cancer. Or viruses cause cancer. Here's we just identified this one. We identified this one. No, that's not where it's at. What causes cancer is this whole symphonic, harmonic array of nutrients acting together. You know, to actually fertilize and cause the growth of cancer. Single biomarkers: blood cholesterol. Everybody wants to get their cholesterol checked, their blood sugar checked. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an indication of you know what happens, but it's an indication. It's not the single cause of whatever it is we're concerned about. It's only one of many, many things. See, when we think of single things, then we want to make drugs just to treat cholesterol and ignore everything else. That's what we do. That's the birth of the statin industry. Everybody takes statins, right? Different this statin, you know, half a dozen different statins or more. <coughs> or blood sugar, taking one thing at a time. Every time we think about that, the drug is right there at your doorstep and in your doctor's office. Here's the drug. 
here's the drug that you do this and do this and do this. Do they ever come along? Do you ever hear a drug, drug representative come along? Hey, you don't need to take these drugs here because all you need to do is change your diet. <laughs> no, they don't do that. Single diseases. Single disease, we think of them. This is, again, we got about 8,000 diseases according to the ICD code. I think it's something like that. Huge number. Each disease has a specific identity. I don't know if we ever thought about this enough, that each disease has its own specific identity. I got this disease or that's it. No, I see that. No, I have this. You have that. Whatever. You know, that's an opportunity for physicians to actually write down what they treat and therefore get compensated for it. One drug on one disease at a time. And so, uh, in fact, the, some years ago, the advertising industry of the pharmaceutical companies uh, really got involved in creating new diseases. You know, if you could create a new disease out of a, a murky area of information, erectile dysfunction is a new disease, by the way. <laughs> erectile dysfunction can be cured by consuming a whole plant based food diet. Everybody hear that? All the men in here that? <laughs> Uh, or, you know, um, ADHD is another one, so, and so forth. And we, there's some of these diseases that have been created, so that then in turn, once you create it, then you can give it some specific, some specific then you can make a drug. That's the system within which we have lived. Um, so it, it encourages discovery use of single drugs, all of which are foreign chemicals out of context. We can't patent, for example, a natural chemical that might have some interesting properties because we can't, we can't patent natural substances. So what we do is they take the chemical, this is, this is a vast majority of drugs, you take the chemical, it's natural, can't patent it, so then you have to synthesize a chemical derivative in order to get a patent for it. So all these drugs are natural, out of context, wrong dose, all that kind of stuff. You can see some, yeah, you can see some immediate bad things. Some drugs are good, it reduces pain, but it's not really the thing that we need to concern ourselves with. So, Including, what are we, where are we going to go with this? So, including nutrition in medical practice requires major changes. I've already mentioned this here. Nutrition is not understood by the public. It's all focused on one thing at a time. Doctors are not trained. There's not a medical school in the country that teaches this stuff. Actually, the majority of my lectures now are to medical schools. I'm really delighted and gratified because the people in medicine obviously are very good people. They're, they're very ambitious, they're very smart. They went to school. They, most of them had a really an interest in really treating people. End of story. I mean, that's a given. And the thing is, they're, they're sort of subjected to a, in an educational environment where they're not taught this kind of thing. So then when they get out, their businesses, their thinking, and so forth and so on, and kind of, they're trapped in some ways. I, I say more or less the same thing to medical schools I'm saying here now. Uh, and in the beginning, I got some silence. <laughs> from some, but uh, actually now, it's, it's fantastic. You know, a lot of doctors coming out of the woodwork and say, well, why wasn't I taught that before? I see as much anger from doctors as anything else as far as emotions are concerned because they're saying, as one guy stood up in the University of Pennsylvania a couple weeks ago, shouted out, you know, and he says, bravo, he shouted out, he says, you tell me how we can pay, we'll all be there. Which told me a lot about, you know, the whole profession. But we need to change, just need changes. Research funding in this area doesn't exist either much. Um, the National Institutes of Health, which funded most of my work, uh, because I, they thought I was working on cancer when I got around to work with nutrition. In any case, um, there are 27 institutes at NIH, the leading biomedical research agency in the world. 27 institutes, a heart institute, a cancer institute, and diabetes, and so forth and so on. There's not one institute of nutrition. Now just think about that. Doctors don't get trained in this area. Biomedical research is not trained in this area. Where do you get the information from? It's from industry. Industry is actually, they, they populate and control the policy boards to set the standards and all this kind of stuff. So we're, we're, we've just got to get the shroud off of us. There's nutrition and medical practice thanks to an image that was uh, published in the New York Times that should acknowledge them. Uh, it's, it's basically that, putting a square peg in a round hole, if you will. It's, it's just, you'll never get nutrition into the current system. The current system has got to change. So if we change, we have lower health care costs. I'm estimating that if everybody were to do this, we would reduce health care costs by 60 to 80%, and that's a conservative figure. That is a huge thing. Faster alleviation of global warming, that's a big deal, too, that you're probably not hearing too much about. 
It's not carbon dioxide or the carbon dioxide footprint that we have to worry about so much. It's the methane that actually has 25 times the capacity on a molecular basis to absorb energy than does carbon dioxide. And where does methane come from? It comes from swamps and so forth and so on, but particularly it comes from livestock rearing. So our use in so much livestock actually is producing all this methane that it gets in the air, it can dissipate it has a half-life of eight years, about. Carbon dioxide is about 100 years or whatever it is. If we stopped consuming livestock right now, we would correct the global warming problem in our lifetimes, possibly. We see changes. The only other way around will never work. Not with the carbon dioxide thing. Anyhow, in less violence prone activities, violence proneness, you know, of all kinds, I'm sure that you're, uh, whether it's with animals, with people, with environment, with this or that, it's just treating our environment, treating ourselves, and our fellow human beings a little more, more decently. Uh, more efficient use of land resources. And I, I would suggest too, this last thing I'm kind of excited about, here's a common ground for political consensus. You know, Republicans, the right wing, the left wing, are arguing, shouting at each other about this and that, and they fight like cats and dogs. You know, I speak to people who are very much on the right, people very much on the left, and, and um, I, I'm finding out, you know, there's equal enthusiasm for this idea in both groups. <laughs> It's really interesting, because the last time I checked, I think most people wanted to be healthy. <laughs> um, I'm going to get through here. I don't have a lot of time. I, I, let, me, let me just check this real quick. Here's what science does, and I, without getting into all the details and rationale for this, it produces research, get an idea, produce research, do some study designs. That's a big story there, what kind of studies you do. Produce evidence. It's for the consumers, and they get help. That's where you get your help from. Yeah, that's what you like to think, right? I, you know, I, I, I like science, yeah. I like science, you say, I, you know, I want, they say, I want them to produce evidence, yeah, so he hears it, I want to be healthy. I mean, the bottom line is that. But unfortunately, this is the way it works. <laughs> you know, we come down and produce evidence, you know, I've been involved in all of these activities, by the way. You put science, you come down, you produce evidence, but the evidence, when it's in a reductionist way, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, focused on focus, focus, focus on one thing, that evidence, if it can be used, to protect it, be protected by intellectual property protection in the marketplace, now you've got a product you can sell. Okay, you give it to industry, they make products, and then we consumers buy those products. So here's what we consumers are doing. Oil in the name or whatever it is, science, I don't know what it is. Um, these products coming down here, you know, minimal health at best. So we, we are, we're supporting this system because we buy these products. Think of the vitamin supplement industry, think of Think of all the gene array analysis that might be coming up in the future, or think of this drug and that drug. Um, so we, we buy the products, then we turn around, it's our taxpayer dollars that go into the production of the system in the beginning. It's the fuel. It's the fuel for the system. So we consumers, we're providing the fuel in the hopes that we're getting the results. That doesn't work that way. We're providing the fuel, sure enough. We're not getting the kind of results that we need to get. So, um, <laughs> this is an aside issue, I kind of had to throw that one in there. You know, if we're going to use uh, the milk of another species, it seems like to me, oh, wait, why do we even need milk? But anyhow, if we're going to do it, why do we get it from one species? Then we have to go to get it from another one. And I put that in here because I came from a farm milking cows. That's me on the front. It's now nine years ago, I guess. <laughs> Oh, just a second, I gotta stop this here. How, how many of you seen the uh, Bill Clinton interview, maybe? Yeah. Well, I, I won't need to necessarily show that. Well, President Clinton actually um, got our book some years ago, thanks to my friend of, a friend of mine, former governor of North Carolina, was also a friend of his and passed it on to him. And he didn't, I think, read it right away, or he did or didn't, but, didn't, but he came out with an interview on, on, on Wolf Blitzer and named the, our book and said, and then you also talked about Dr. Esselton, my good friend, who I was a surgeon for Cleveland Clinic. And so Esselton and I and have been the great benefactor, or the public has been the benefactors, I think, of what from this. I'm going to stick that because um, it's the interest of time. You know the China studies there on the left. And over the years since it uh, first came out, the book is just, I can't believe it keeps on going. I would highly thank you.
One of the things I was often asked over the years, and I couldn't do anything about it because I don't even know all the pots and pans in the kitchen are, as my wife tells me. Uh, I want to give credit to my wife for actually having our, our whole family been this way, 100%. She's the one who does the cooking. She's the one who got me to write the book. not done with this right here, having a cookbook. And that's just, we just, my, our daughter, with some recipes from her mother, my wife, of course, uh, and her two grandchildren, one of whom is here, have come out with this book, and this is one of the first opportunities we've had set on the table, so if you want to know where it's, you get a cookbook from it, here it is. I've been reminded over the years, I've been finally in a stage now to say something, because somebody would say, why don't you publish a book? Well, there's a lot of good books out there, but this is a, kind of unique in the sense that it is actually no added uh, fat and, and sugar. So it's like the way you think it is. One final thing that uh, has been very, very exciting is, it has to do with the foundation that um, we got organized uh, thanks to a former student of mine who took a class of mine at Cornell and some other people. And it's really taken off. And it's an online course, very unique of it. And to see one, one opportunity to study plant based nutrition in a way in which you can do it from your home. It's an interactive kind of thing. We have professional instructors with each session that people go through, and it's all very exciting. So we've been uh, authorized to now award continuing medical education to doctors and other professionals. And about a third of our, our students suddenly right now are doctors. So we're really making inroads into the medical community, which is all very nice. So thank you very much. <laughs>